Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our newest podcast at Dead Men Inc. Productions called 22 Minutes Later. My name is Ken Johnson, leader of Dead Men Inc. Productions, and joining me is my usual co-host of the Bomb Voyage podcast, Travis Steffens. How are you doing today? Eh, I'm doing fine. <laughs> so, for those of you guys listening to us, either from our previous work or for the first time on digitalnerdage.com, a big announcement we had with that today. Um, this is a new podcast we wanted to do as kind of a commentary, I mean a complimentary piece to our Saturday Morning Fever show. Saturday Morning Fever, we always talk about bad TV. This show, for the most part, we want to talk about good TV. Because I feel like television, in particular television episodes, is something that often gets glanced over a lot of the time. Because usually when you hear someone talk about television... You hear them talk about all of television, like, Hi, Travis, I think that you should watch Breaking Bad. Uh, what, what, what of Breaking Bad should I watch? All of Breaking Bad. And don't get me wrong, you should watch all of Breaking Bad. But, you get my point. Um, there's a lot, it's really cool to more look at, like, individual episodes of shows and see in a small period of time of 22 minutes... You know, how much people can really get across and do, like, amazing things. Because television has, like, a million things going wrong with it compared to movies. And the fact that good television gets made at all sometimes can feel like a miracle. And there's so much of it, and not much of it gets discussed. So that's why we created this show. So how this show is going to work is each week we're going to have a brief theme. And me and Travis will individually pick out an episode for both of us to watch. Um, and then 22 minutes later, when the episode is completed, we jump back on the microphone, we both give our thoughts about it. Um, and that's all there really is to it. Um, and speaking of this being the pilot episode of this particular podcast, we figured there'd be no better theme to start with than pilot episodes. So, um, what do you like about pilots, Travis? What I like about pilots is they introduce, what they should do, is introduce everything you need to know about the show and why you want to watch it in just a clear and concise, that's what a good pilot is, is why do I give this show the rest of my time? Because I can't watch everything out there. If there's a million things out there, there's a million shows to watch, why do I watch this one? You get one, maybe two episodes to tell me why. Absolutely. The way I've always kind of worded it is a pilot episode is a 22 minute long trailer for everything else you're going to do to an extent. Like it still has to do its own thing, but like, like, like you said, that's the biggest thing is that there's just literally so much media out there that convincing someone to stick around for longer than one episode and not be entertained can be a death sentence for a lot of people. Um, and often this can... Uh, jeopardize a lot of shows. Either shows have problems where they don't air in order, or sometimes with animes where they choose to have like a demo episode that they kind of throw in the middle in the beginning, and then actually do the plot pilot, like as episode two, as it like we did with Full Out Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, which that almost turned me off of the show until you explained to me that that was the case, and I gave it one more episode, and I was like, okay, this is actually good. Um, and for sure, I think this is a topic we might come back to again, because there's actually a lot of really good pilots we'd like to talk about, but after laddering, and a lot of bad pilots, um, but after going through a lot of different shows, we picked, I think me and Travis picked, although two shows that both of us would definitely say that both of us enjoy, we had some very different selections, um, for, for this list, and so, Travis, why don't we tell you, tell us a little bit about your... Uh, pilot choice for this week. Okay, I picked Young Justice because I, uh, I'll we'll obviously get to this more about when when we're talking about it. But it does a lot of really cool, interesting things that made me that really turned me on to the show. When I, I heard a lot about it and I heard it was really good, but it wasn't my type of thing usually. Mm -hmm. And this it it was a show that it was. The pilot episode that really convinced me, like, oh, this is way better than I ever thought it would be going to be. Absolutely. That's kind of how I worked with it, too, is the idea that, like, when it was airing, I mean, obviously we'll talk a little more about the production problems and stuff when we're done, but one of the major ones, production problems they did have was that this film was advertised horribly. Like, you, you barely ever see, 
Like, I literally didn't see a single advertisement for the show until they were almost to the second season. And by then, it was practically canceled. So, like, there... didn't watch it until it was. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I only really ended up watching it because it, um, I found it a scrolling around show. I literally just finished watching all of Justice League, all four seasons of Justice League. And, you know, obviously looking up the word Justice on Netflix, Young Justice is right next to it. Um, so I figured, all right, all right, I'll finally, you know, give this show a shot. And without going into major spoilers, the best pitch I can give this show is they came up with a way to do a show about the Justice League B team in a really interesting way. And that's all we're going to say about it until we see you again 22 minutes later. Rose, Rose, fight the power! Rose, Rose, fight the power! So we are back uh, 22 minutes later after watching episode one, season one of Young Justice. And it's probably the third or fourth time I've watched this show and still, dang old boy, is that a good time. Just This is only the second time I've watched it after the, the, the first time I watched it after my original watching. Mm -hmm. Like I've only watched it, I've. I've been kept me in, oh, I should go back to that show. I mean, this is as good. Yeah, it's as good as I remember it exactly it being. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's why I really picked this this one to talk about is because I watched it after it was completely done with. It was canceled. Everyone had seen it already, and everyone's like, oh, my God, you have to watch it. This oh, is yeah, really like, yeah. the best show ever. And I always have a slightly harder time with those shows where people are like, oh, you gotta watch it, you gotta watch it. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. If, if people just bombard me with that, it always puts me off a little bit. Right. This episode completely changed my mind. It was like, right. oh, wow, this is done. Yeah, so this is, that's what a pilot needs. It introduces all your characters. Mm-hmm. Really quickly, here's what they about, here's they are, here's what we're going to do. Even then, and it starts off, it definitely makes you want to watch more. Yes. Because even right now, we have to talk about I'm like, but but episode two. Right. But right, I don't want to talk about this right now, because I want to watch more. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a strong feeling that Young Justice might be a show we come back to in some form or another in the future, but yeah. The, um, the thing I like about it is the, the major point that you brought up is like how quickly it uh, shows off the unique personalities of all these characters without having to just explain it. Um, there's an opening sequence in the episode where for a scheme that we're unaware of yet, um, all these different Ike villains that happen to all be ice related, all attacking the si different cities at different times. So you see each of our heroes... And their, their mentor character, because this show follows the the titular, you know, like, copied kid sidekick cliched character of each of these different characters. So Aquaman has Aqualad, Batman has Robin, Flash has Kid Flash, and so on. And, and Green Arrow has Speedy. Um, so off the bat, you're already getting the sense that this is the interesting, like, hook they're going to do in the series. Is we are going to follow the B team. We're going to follow... The, the unsung hero Justice League characters that we don't know about and are usually left as just cliche carbon copies of their adult selves. And right off the bat, not only do you get like one or two line explanations of kind of what role each of these guys will fill, but you get to immediately say how their personalities differ from the quote unquote source character that they're, um, that they're based off of. You know, Robin is, you know, he is the leader type, but you can tell that he carries just as many of Batman's bad qualities as his good cop qualities. And although he's as intelligent as Batman, he's not as mature as Batman. And you know that within, like, three lines. Because that's how well this is written. You know, like, Aquaman is the more leadership stoic type, Kid Flash is the funny guy, and, um... Uh, Speedy is the debatably the oldest of the group, and he can he's kind of the more angsty, I'm too good for this kind of shtick guy in the show. And they don't need much time to explain that. This is all within like the cold open you 
know all of this. That's how efficient this episode is with its time. Which is the best thing, I think, what makes good pilots. How efficient you are with your time. And something we'll get to part two of this whole thing. Anyway, but um, there's a lot to really like about this episode. Um, and about the show in general. Um, show in general stuff really quickly. The animation is fantastic. The fight choreography is great. Um, the voice acting, for the most part, is, is great. And although the Justice League characters themselves don't have a lot to do... They are also very quickly established, and you know them, and you're familiar with them. Um, and they're really, like, especially Batman. Like, it seems weird to, like, compliment someone for playing, like, a good Batman, because it's been done before. But there's something, it'd be so easy for the, of all canons, it'd be so easy for them to make this, a, like, a very curmudgeonly, father-knows-best kind of Batman. And they don't really do that. He's a guy who is able to speak less and say more when he, you know, says things, when there's a line in it that, you know, he just like, well, I thought when we could just, you know, maybe bend the rule this one time. Green Arrow says that to him, and Batman doesn't respond with, no, we can't do this because of this, this, and this. He just crosses his arms and scowls at him. He goes, um, or maybe not. Like, that's what I like about it. Yeah, but, um, anyway, uh, yeah, but, um, yeah, see, that's a lot what this show does right. Like, there's a bunch of the small things, even. Like, I didn't notice this until I watched it this time, but, like, the, when they all go leave and, like, no, you gotta stay here, you can't come with us, they leave, Red Tornado hesitates just for a second and looks back and then goes. And then, <laughs> I didn't catch that. Oh, that's why I said, oh, about earlier. Really? Anyway. Oh, I think you meant something anyway. else. Okay. But, like, that was the thing that, like, that plays later. And I was like, oh, that's a small little moment that's going to play later. And it's just the smallest of details. Absolutely. But it's like, oh, that just was a little thing. And I'm just like, oh, when you watch it the second time, like, oh, that has later significance. And it, the, there's a bunch of the small things. Oh, absolutely. That's really cool. The thing I like about this, uh, the pilot plot in general I really like, is that it constantly fits, and if you look at this whole thing from like a hero's journey kind of thing, like this episode is filled with a lot of um, impossible choices, like within, like, they're, then they're very structured as like a beginning of the journey kind of choice, like, hey, we started on this situation, and the situation ended up being more intense than we thought it was. Do we sit back and call for help or do we go through it with ourselves? And constantly as it goes on, those decisions become more and more and more intense until eventually they realize, when they finally get to the point of like, okay, maybe we maybe overdid it a little bit. Let's finally call for help. Oops! Oh, probably should have called for that option earlier because now it's not available to you anymore. Um, and they, they you escalate from... Without getting too much major spoilers in the episode, you start out with something as simple as, we're going to go off and help stop a fire that might have potentially something the tiniest bit more suspicious about it. And by the end, you have these three, you know, like, rookie-ish sidekick characters who are, for lack of a better term, dealing with what is very clearly a Justice League-level problem. And are not able to deal with that problem as well as they would have liked to, to deal with it. Um, and what even works better, I like the symbol the symbolism of like the story like of them continually like going down in the elevators. And it kind of works with that idea of like how like further and further like they're literally going further into the you know the forbidden place um, while they're also further going into like maybe we should actually have like Done the responsible thing. <laughs> this is a bad show, but like, where they would make a reference how they're going deeper into the rabbit hole. Yeah, like Sorry. they don't mention it; they just do it. That's but, the main thing about this whole show is just they don't say they're doing something; they just do the thing. Yes, and then like one of the one of the really cool parts is it really shows that they're rookies; they're really new at this. But it doesn't show that they're bad; they're that they're not bad; at it. they're just on. They're not ready at this level, especially in the way their teamwork. Yes. That plays on for a big part of the show later, 
Yes. Right now, they're all completely doing their own thing. Like, he runs away where they're still fighting, and mm-hmm. then he's like, oh, I thought you were you were supposed to be right behind me. Yes. Because that's how we do it. And they even explain that from the very beginning of the show. That they explain that as the particularly, that is the main thing that Batman and Aquaman say to the team at the very beginning, is it's not that you guys aren't good enough heroes. You were just not, like, it's not that you guys are not trained. You were just not trained to be members of this team. Which completely makes sense when you look at, like, actual, like, good Justice League material, like the Justice League show, it's not just seven random people all beating up on people. Like, they work in, like, this ridiculously in sync tandem, and in the very few moments of the show that you see the Justice League actually taking care of a problem, you see that. And when you see the later episodes when, spoiler alert, these guys learn their lesson and actually learn some teamwork, you know, they actually, you know, you get to see that, too. Um, and in particular, in a superhero story, I think the idea of doing the B-team narrative is really powerful. And I think this pilot establishes very clearly that just because these guys are the B-team does not mean they're any less interesting or any less capable of being an awesome show than watching... You know, it's like, you watch this show, and you go into it saying, like, okay, this is cool, but why don't I just watch Justice League? And the show does answer that question. Very well. And the cliffhanger, like, this this show, (laughs) watching the show has so many cliffhangers, it's frustrating. And this one's, again, really, really good. If I can make, yeah, go ahead. Oh, why am I not watching the next episode right now? Yeah, I will. If I can make one suggestion about people who want to watch the show, and I would say definitely that both of us would recommend the show, if you're going to watch it, carve out some time to binge. Because if you do not do that, you're going to be beating yourself up so badly when you have to rip yourself away and go back to normal responsibilities <laughs> when, you, when you finally have to put the show down. Because this show is very good at. Oh, what's going to happen now? Well, you're going to have to tune in the next episode. Uh, Which also leads into the fact that, without any spoilers, the show did end up being cancelled prematurely. And that is a fan rage that still echoes through the internet today. Yeah, but... But that's a story for another day. Um, Any uh, any other thoughts you have on this uh, this pilot or this show in general? Um, I don't know. It's a... As we said, it's a really good show. Can't recommend it enough. As a pilot, it does everything it needs to be. And it does it efficiently. It doesn't diddle-daddle in any parts. Everything that is there needs to be there and is there for a reason. And done. You can't... I can't think of off the top of my head a more efficient pilot, truthfully. Absolutely. Um, as, as far as what we said in the very beginning, like, I think the only thing that pins this for me is that the ultimate objective of, of episode one of a show is to get people to watch episode two. And the fact that me and Travis, the people who have watched this entire show from the beginning to end, even while recording, debate dropping everything and watching more of this show, should stand as a testament to how good this show is. And that's it. Now let's go watch more of the show. <laughs> oh, or we can do the other one. Two seasons of television later. <laughs> All right, so part two of our episode, we come down to my choice. And I rattled on a couple different pilots for this one, but ultimately the one I chose to pick, so I wanted to pick something different than Travis's to show some range here, is I picked a pilot to a relatively unknown anime called Dead Man Wonderland. Um, This show has a very weird history behind it. Long story short, uh... This show bombed like crazy in Japan so that when Toonami started up, they bought it for like ultra cheap. And then the American director decided like, hey, let's make this show not suck. And then he made it awesome. And it sold way better in America than it sold in Japan, which almost never happens. Um, So it's a show I don't even want to talk plot wise because it, you literally, I I can't think of anything I can say about the show that isn't just immediately pilot spoilers. Um... Uh, what I will say about the show is I like the show because it's a anime that is only 10 to 12 episodes long, but it gets so much done 
in that period of time between you know, twists and turns and subtle changes in the genre and cool camera tricks and nice characters and like it just the amount of stuff that gets done in this pilot or even just done per episode and series they get more done in 10 episodes than most shows get done in two seasons um the only thing i will say about this show before we get started is that uh those of you with weak constitutions please leave the podcast uh this is this is a very like hard r bloody gory anime i love it for that but be aware of that before you pop this in on your Netflix with your kitties and all that. So, uh, you have anything opening to say or should we just get started? Let's get started. I'll save my stuff later. Okay. Bro, bro, fight the power! Bro, bro, fight the power! Hmm. Alright, so... Ending our part two, 22 minutes later. Uh, Dead Man Wonderland only season, episode one. Oi, where do I start? Um, I guess first off I should say this is not a... It is literally impossible to talk about this without at least pilot spoilers, so... I'm assuming you're gonna watch this, so keep that in mind, but... Cause without that, it'd just be like, well, uh... Our protagonist has kind of a bad day. <laughs> well, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I could say. Ugh. Man, I know. Okay, the one thing I want to we'll start with is, like I said in the beginning, the thing I was immediately drawn to this show when I first watched it is just the efficiency of like how much information they're able to portray in a way that doesn't feel like this constant exposition. You're opening scene of this production is all like it literally almost feels like a in a way it's, it's very self-aware almost like a parody of most like anime openings like you have these three characters and you would imagine like if this was any other anime in the world like okay this would be our trio and they go off on their fun adventures and they will have their little quirkiness to them and they and they do and that's what i like about the scene but on top of that before the show goes in a different direction like if you're actually listening to what they're saying you actually do get cued into a lot of subtle but important plot details you know that this is a this is a world where something really bad happened in tokyo and no one really goes anywhere other than just to kind of look at the remains of whatever's there uh we know that ganda has some sort our main character has some sort of an amnesia complex we don't know exactly what to what degree you know we have a lot of those kind of things um set up for us we get a little bit of their personalities but then immediately within about the first two minutes of the episode uh the show takes a giant left turn and this mysterious character known as the red man just brutally murders everybody in this classroom and hits Ganta with some sort of this red diamond kind of thing that gets injected into his into his chest um as he just kind of looks on in horror of everything that's gone on and then just boom dead man wonderland and to put this in perspective um when i watched this show i watched it a hundred percent blind i literally saw the tsunami was starting up the week that this show came out and i scrolled through what was on the start lineup and I saw that they had a show, didn't even read the description, it's called Dead Man Wonderland. And I kid you not, I thought, hey, that's kind of a fun title, I'll DVR this and watch it later. And then I got that far to the episode, and it just Dead Man Wonderland. And I literally paused it, and I'm like, okay, I think I need a minute. When I got that far. Like, it's just, I was just like, holy crap. And I'd like to say that the show slows down after that point. It's a little bit, you know, easier to swallow, but no. Oh. It just, but to that point, one thing I, I will say that was that this pilot in the show in general is, the show does a very good job of not desensitizing you. 
Like, sure, there are, like, gorier or darker or bloodier shows out there, but it's what the show does with it and never does it to an extent where you're surrounded by so much death or so much destruction that it just becomes just second nature and you can just kind of just, kind of blows by you. See, when I, I read the manga way before the anime came out. Okay. Like, I don't want to sound like a hipster, but... I was in. I was in Game of Wonderland before no. it was cool. No, no, uh, no, but uh, so I knew everything going into it because I read the manga way before. I'm like, oh, they're making anime. It's really cool. Oh, I'm excited! I already watched it or already read it. See, and like, kind of forgot about it mostly. Yes. Until I'm like, oh right, yeah. So going into it, I knew all the. So I never got that huge moment like like this is the kind of show this is because i knew because i read it and i've been there but it is so good still still watching it you still get the the feeling because it takes its time really nicely in the beginning oh yes and just it most shows if they were doing like this would just do this and that would be like a 30 second thing this takes a good five minutes or so just dealing with it and giving me these characters who were going to die in oh, oh, half yeah. a second. <laughs> They're all getting destroyed. Character, it gives them background. Yeah. It gives them, like, even the things, like, the little charms, and they all had the same yeah. one, just a little different. Right. And all the little things. And then they just get brutally murdered. Like, I know I kind of made this joke about the, this, the, this opening kind of making at least, like, somewhat of a reference to these kind of animes. But, like, I would totally watch, you know, like, an Elseworlds, like, happy-go-lucky, you know, normal anime with these three characters, because I actually like, really like their dynamic and all that, but that is not the show we have put in front of us. So, um, moving forward to the show, you, you end up with, since he's the only one left alive, he gets blamed for all of these murders, um... And he's immediately introduced to his court-appointed lawyer, Mr. Tamaki. Um, which... The thing I like about this character is that it's, his character isn't necessarily a bait-and-switch, but the show is aware of your expectations. This is the kind of character, either in his character design or the way he speaks, the second this guy comes on camera, you go, okay, something's up with this guy. Like, they're not trying to hide that. It's... What is up with this guy, and how much is up with this guy that they actually do a pretty good job of hiding? Um, you know, you, this whole premise in general, even going into the court, like you just have this idea that there's just more going on than you're being led on to. And you're seeing it all from Ganta's perspective, which I think is the best thing about this show, especially this pilot, is this idea that sure, you can be like all animes are from the protagonist's perspective, but like. This show is very much from his perspective. The show makes you, you know, you are very, like, attached to, like, feeling what he is feeling when he feels it. You know, seeing everything really from his perspective, getting inside of his head. Um, so when you're left with that effect on a pilot like this that just puts this guy through his emotional paces as this thing goes on, it's really hard not to be desensitized to it and not to just be overwhelmed with the, the amount of just sadness and horribleness happening, but you don't. You know, like, there's this moment in his head when he doesn't realize that Tamaki is not on his side where he says, you know, everything is going to be okay and I'll do everything in my power to make sure you're okay. And he just has, like, you can't even call it a smile. Like, this, just this crying tears of melancholy, for lack of a better term. Like, this is literally the closest thing to good news he has had in this whole situation. And it's not even good news. It's just, just his tiniest glimmer of hope. Which is what you need as an audience member to feel something when ten seconds later that glimmer of hope is smashed into a billion pieces. <laughs> oh, man. And then... Even on a technical level, I like it because the, not only is the animation just absolutely gorgeous, but like when he's given his sentence by the courts, they have this beautiful animated reverse vertigo shot 
from from his perspective where they start out with with, with, with his perspective. The capital punishment, his eyes is devastated, and they slowly back away and pan and warp to the um, to the rest of the courtroom and all that. And I find the fact that more and more animes these days are doing more like advanced camera tricks, for lack of a better term, really fascinating because you don't have a camera to physically do that. You have to animate the effect of you know a, you know of a crash zoom or a you know or a changing focus or like all of these crazy things. And this is I know there's other ones that do this stuff, but this is the first show, at least for me, where I saw that was using like those kind of advanced camera tricks and stuff like that, and that's what really sucked me in. And things just keep getting worse for this kid, but you still but it keeps moving at a brisk enough pace of new places and new environments and new ideas and all that to keep you uh, to keep you interested. I I do say it, it a small little complaint is we don't get really enough of Dead Man Wonderland to get yeah, into it. Yeah, absolutely. Like that, like, act, they don't usually get that until like almost the third act. Yeah, they. I think just just a little bit more time and seeing what Wonderland's about. Right. Because it feels a lot different in the second episode. Oh yes. And then later, I don't remember what episode. Then it gets really episode different. Episode five. Okay. This this episode this season without spoilers I'm gonna tell you where they are. There are two moments in this series where yeah, this they they do more drastic twists than you're probably used to. But I think that the show does better for that. Yeah, but in the first episode, we said this before. It's about explaining exactly what it's about and what the show uh-huh. is that, and the show has it, it show gets the feeling down it gets the feel down and this is how you're gonna be yeah you're, this is how you're gonna feel it just it needs a little just a tiny bit more plot i always thought oh yeah i hear that the first episode like you get the feeling that, like it it puts a lot of strands out oh yeah say, we'll get to this this will be cool later you get the seed of the guy and the, and the all the candy yeah and then that but does I just wanted a little bit more detail. Oh, absolutely, they show. I think. It, I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to strike a balance between like establishing the first episode, but also like, like you said, like leaving out strands and like getting you, and you know, asking the proper questions to want to go forward. Just like, which is a different approach for sure, as far as like different ways to get someone to be interested in the second episode than Young Justice. So that actually unintentionally works as kind of an interesting little different way to do things, and I'm glad that we've we've got that, but, like, the other thing, though, is they don't, whenever you have big reveals in this episode, or they have things that they don't explain yet, the interesting thing about it, though, is that they don't bash you over the head with it. Like, first episode, they reveal that Tamaki, his court-appointed lawyer, is actually one of the, the head people at Dead Man Wonderland. And they don't say that. They just literally just open up a scene where he's just there. And he's just doing his job and doing the thing. And they never take a moment to be like, oh, I tricked him into, like, they, they don't do that. They just, he's just there and just carries on the scene as he casually would. And it puts in that moment of the audience where like, oh. Then immediately afterwards he says a couple more lines and you're like, oh. Like, it's, it is a, there's a lot of, like, this show does a really good job of, like, the addition of, like, one more line, hinting at, like, one more thing, instantly has you, like, oh, crap, I gotta figure out what this thing is. Like, it's, um, this show's, you're never, this show is a very good job of keeping you hungry when it comes to, like, it, 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 it's baiting of questions and that kind of thing. Even as far as, like, trying to, like, is a pilot like, pinning down like what kind of anime this is going to be. They leave a lot of questions, that kind of thing, very ambiguous, especially when they leave it until like literally the last three minutes of the show to even promote the fact that this anime has any form of like true supernatural element to it. Um, or at least a, you know, like a major one connected to our protagonist. Um, and as far as the protagonist himself, the thing I really like about it is that he is an example 
of how to, the way I think I would word this. He's an example of how to do a particular character character type right that is literally done wrong like ninety nine percent of the time. Like in any other show, you would want to shoot this kid in the face. Like it's they're taking that character who is like, and I, I don't mean this is a, like any sort of negative against Ganta as a character. He's a great character. He is whiny. He cries a lot, he complains a lot, and he often can be very self-centered with his own emotions. But god damn it, I love this character. <laughs> like, yeah, the thing is, they, they use that, they know that, they admit that, and they know that's a fall of it. Where every other character, like, even my favorite show, like, has a big part of that where the main character gets really whiny and it, to get over that. Absolutely. It's... If it wasn't just that, I, it would be the worst show ever. And in this show, they know that and they use that. That's what makes right. it so much better. Like, the thing I would say, that, like, the, the kind of protagonist I think he, Ganta is, I would say is like, it's the opposite of what some people call like the Naruto syndrome. The idea of like, a character that has had like a lot of really bad things happen to him. It's like, he's that character like, oh, well, if I just believe hard enough and work, you know, to... Hard enough, I can just make things happen. And, like, it's literally, like, you know, almost making a joke towards your show. Like, you know, like, if I can just create enough determination, I'll find the power kind of thing. And this show is the exact opposite. This is a protagonist that exists in a world of hopelessness. And he doesn't find his power in hope. He finds it in finding, like, the strength in his misery. Like, the moment at the end when he finally has to, like, stand up to everything, it's not like he's like, I believe, and I'm going to find the optimist and everything. He's like, I'm going to destroy the world for what it did to me. Like, this is a guy who, like, finally stands up to himself and says the, like, I refuse to die yet because I have to, to end this. I have to find the son of a bitch that did all of this to me. I need to take my revenge, specifically, for the horrible things that have been done in my name. And just this outcry of, I want to live. Like, just this acknowledgement of, like, I literally put the quote, like, on my first business cards. I named my company, Dead Men Inc., after this show. I love the show so much. This idea of, like, I don't care how crazy the world gets, I want to survive. Like, that's what just grabbed me about this show and about that character in particular. I do have to say, I like that moment, but I hate that line. I don't like the... Okay. I want to... It's a good moment. It's just the line that okay. irks me. That's interesting. I don't mind it, but that's perfectly fair. Like, I get it. Like... I, I get what they're going for and I get what they're doing it. And it's still a good moment. It doesn't ruin the moment. I still... Still like, okay, yeah, that that was cool and heart-wrenching. You get it. I just, that line makes me go, ugh, a little tiny. Just, just a little. Right. I mean, as far as Wonderland itself, it's an interesting concept. Like, um, in, in the broadest of terms, it's, you know, it, it it's inmates of all different varieties are all being, instead, uh, instead of, like, doing normal, the normal prison thing, their privately owned prison who they run a, an amusement park that is, uh, this twisted amusement park that's run by prison inmates running the rides and doing the clowns and doing that, you know, doing the, their whole thing, um, which they get deeper into in later episodes and exactly how, like, deep and dark and twisted that is. But, like, the, from the get-go, though, you get this idea of, like, this is something more complicated than just, like, they don't even talk about that until they get to that moment. you like, oh... Well, he's in death row, and so he's going to go to jail. So it's going to be a series about a kid who is in jail. And then they get to the next scene, you're like, oh, this isn't an anime about a kid that's in jail. It's a kid who's in Dead Man Wonderland, um, which doesn't even like a, a play in words. Like, like the, the, that is the name of a dark and twisted park, which I found was cool. Like, it's like, they could have easily called the park something normal, and had the show named Dead Man Wonderland, like, no, like, it is what it is. And there's even more, like, you can, like, people have extrapolated from that. I mean, have you actually seen people who have tried to use, like, 
refer specifically to the word Wonderland and, like, try to find, like, the, like, you know, like, Alice in Wonderland comparisons and other things like that. Not in, like, a linear sense, but, like, yeah, yeah. there you can't watch something with the word Wonderland in the title and not at least have that, you know, th that idea there and how they, they tackle things. Or, like, even you see, like, hints of, like, different senses of theming, like how they keep pointing to this weird dancing flower with a guitar in Tamaki's office, and you wonder what that's about, or how you wonder why there's birds everywhere. You wonder why, you know, people refer to this certain thing as this certain name, or you you wonder about who, you know, you get this idea that some people know some information about it, but no one so far, you believe, knows all of everything that's going on. Like, that's the kind of stuff that, that drags you in. And the thing that got me the most is the literal very end. Like, how important it is that not only do they play the piano theme of the, the main thing of the show, like, one last time, but the literal final line of the show is this giant panning sky cam of the entire decrepit park as the announcer on the PA system just says, Welcome to Dead Man Wonderland. Is it on the nose a little bit? Sure. Is it effective? Hell yes. And I watched this back when it was just airing week per week. I had to wait until next week to watch the next episode. And I just sat there in my chair just, just stunned at the show. It wasn't the first adult anime I've watched, but I hadn't watched that many since. And I've watched more since. And it's still one of the better ones I've seen. And especially for short form anime, um, this is what I've always referred to as like this like the golden standard. If you're gonna get like what for the most part is considered, you know, your entire plot line done in like one season, you're contained, you're done. Um like, this is, like, a really good example of, like, the way to do it. But, like, all the stuff we talked about, it's worth mentioning. Even, like, with the plot of this show, in both these shows, this is all, like, 20, only 22 minutes of content. Both of these shows, and all that crap got done. Like, that's what I made the show to talk about. Um, is just how much you can communicate in that amount of time. And hell... Later on in this show, we might be talking about other shows, one in particular, Travis Potter, is what I'm talking about, that gets quite a bit done in only 11 minutes worth of time, which is even crazier. Um, yeah. if they're, like, I think we did a good job of picking two shows that have a, do a really good job of showing how much an individual episode of a television show can accomplish, and that's what we want to explore on this show. So, I guess, yeah, welcome to Dead Man Wonderland, and welcome to 22 Minutes Later. Do you have anything you'd like to say as a wrap-up to these two shows, or what you'd like to get out of this podcast moving forward? Uh, I think this, I think it went really well, and I think it's... Well, fair enough. So, um, we will, I'm not sure how often we'll do this podcast, and we're going to try to do it as often as we can, uh, just because we finally got a format for doing one of these where, you know, we can, uh, you know, do it organized and not, you know, like our other podcasts. But yeah, um, if you want to check out any of our other stuff, uh, you can find stuff online at facebook.com slash deadmaninc or soundcloud.com slash deadmaninc. Check us out on digitalnerdage.com. Um, and there'll be all sorts of fun projects for you there. Uh, next time on 22 Minutes Later, um, although we will not be announcing what shows we are going to be picking, uh, the main thing I want to do for our next episode is I want to do Hidden Gems. This can either be, you can interpret this two different ways. Either you can pick a show in general that you think a lot of people don't run into or is underappreciated or that kind of thing, or you can pick a common show they might have, like, an episode in mind that you find that, like, not a lot of people talk about. Um, and we that's probably what we're going to do next time. So uh, until next time, we will see you on 22 Minutes Later. Do the impossible, see the invisible. Bro, bro, fight the power. Crush the untouchable, break the unbreakable. Row, row, fight the